<laughs> I don't know why I'm so awkward about it. Okay. I am going to begin now. I'm going to take my jacket off. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Because I'm starting to get warm. Okay, can you go to the first slide? So today we are talking about forgiveness, grace, and mercy. So forgive me for my awkwardness. Give me grace and hope. And, and Walt gives me lots of mercy. I just <laughs> no. So um, we've been going through a series of who are we? And in this series, we're talking about our DNA. We're talking about who we are as like going forward. And um, like uh, as we're going forward, like this running, we're, um, we're, we're trying to step in from, from a legacy where it's just thinking back on what we want to stand for to a lifestyle, what we want to live out. Right, guys? And so in that, we're going to talk about just DNA. We started off with, um, with a, a love past our limits. And we're loved past our limits. That means that like, we have a God who loves past limitations. And he actually breaks those limitations with his love. The, the next part is, is that an intentionally intimate God. And the intentionally intimate God does everything with intention and purpose and point. And he, he sees you and accepts you. And he ultimately wants relationship with you. Which leads us today, forgiveness, grace, mercy. Go to the next slide. All right, so we see the man on the moon. I really was thinking about this, and uh, this example I'm about to say probably does not go with as many people in the room as like had in my brain. I was like, had this epic idea. I was like... It's going to be awesome. But anyways, I was really thinking about what was it like when it was nationally televised, the guy stepping on the moon. They stopped, for the, they stopped school. They literally showed it on like in every classroom. And up to that point, it was impossible to go to the moon. It was a dream. It was fantasy movies. It was only in these fantasy movies that seemed fake. It was like, man, that, that's a great idea, but it's not possible, right? But then at that moment that that man stepped on the moon, did it become a possibility? Was it real? In that moment, all around the world, it was no longer a dream. It was a, a reality that could happen. It became something that people invested their lives in. It became the dream of every little kid. It was no longer a fantasy, but it was a dream for kids to step into being an astronaut. Amen? <laughs> Y'all don't even know where I'm going yet. I just got to say amen to an Obama. <laughs> Obama thing. I'm just joking. <laughs> so Obama's next. I know for me, the, the next biggest event that like reflected this was when Obama was about to be elected president. And for me, as a person of color, I know that when I saw Obama coming into that presidency, no matter what you think about his politics, that was a momentous moment. Because up to that point, it had only been a joke that a person of color could be the president. It was a place where we didn't believe. It was a great fantasy. It was a great idea. But at that point, as soon as he became president, the idea that a woman could be a president, that a person of color could be a president, Really, even that any possibility was open to us. It was no longer this just fantasy. It was actually now a dream that really people could pick up. In the same way, for us here, I think that sometimes forgiveness is a great fantasy. But we actually don't have a context for how it feels to be forgiven. When we talk about mercy, it's a great idea and great words. But it seems impossible. Sometimes grace is a great ideal, but sometimes we don't have a context for it. It's just words, and they have a great distance, but the way we feel connected to it is impossible. But in this place where the impossible becomes possible is when it's televised, when, it, when it's open, when it's stated, when we experience it, when we witness it ourselves with another person. 
in that place, it's like a grandstands, you know, the spinning top. It's like when we actually see an example of what it is, hey, come here, Riker, come here, come here, come here. It's like the keys, you know what I mean? And the truth is, is that like we get to see it right in front of us and you're on TV. Did you know that? But it's like when we see it, you can go back over there to your dad. It's like when, we <laughs> of course, like it's like when we see it, we actually believe it. We have a hope for it. It's no longer a fantasy, but it's a dream. And the truth is, is when Christ died for each of us, it gave us an opportunity. But sometimes it's hard for us to traverse what is just an opportunity to actually become a dream for us, to an experience for us. And that's what we're talking about today. Next slide. Guess what time it is. Some of you guys missed out. Missed it. It's been gone. It's been on hiatus. But guess what? I'm going to be calling on people today. <laughs> so. Oh. Oh. I got the power. Yep. So, hey, stay off the stage, though. You know, you can come down here. But anyway, so... Testimony time is a part where you can say, like, your history. This is a moment where we're talking about whatever's stirring up inside of you, and you come up here, and you got about, like, you know, two minutes, not 35 minutes. I, I'll yank the mic. And if we don't get somebody to come up, I'm going to choose somebody. We get real awkward. Oh, you, you're going to already, she already ready to come up. Okay. So, testimony Let's come on and testify of God. You already raised your hand. Come on. And I see you, Robert. What are you going to say? I check, check. Don't really. <laughs> I never thought this really through. That's okay. <laughs> you can go sit down if you want. Um... <laughs> Testify. Uh, testify. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's okay. We'll we'll have you come up another time. All right. Something good that's happened to me. Well, I've got a friend that I've made, and she's somewhere back there. <laughs> um, and uh, she's really nice to me, and I really like her as a friend because um, she can be very trustworthy. And um, uh, yeah. Amen. Woo, woo, woo. All right, come on. Come on, Big Boss. This is Big Boss Ryan. Yep. So, short version. Um, I'm a recovering addict, and I should not be here today. I should be dead at least a handful of times uh, just in this last summer. Um, as, as many people close to me know, I've been struggling to find my purpose. I've been like, how? How do you find that? How do you listen to God? What are the signs? And uh, in an NA meeting last night, someone said something, and it dawned on me what my purpose was. And, you know, we all say we're supposed to be fishers of men. Yeah, okay, that, that's very a simple, simple thing to say, but how do you specifically do that? What does that specifically look like? And to me, what I believe God is calling me to do is I got taken out of the fire. I got taken out of this place of evil, drugs. Uh, you name it, anything sinful, I was about that. And I'm, I feel like I'm supposed to be going back into those places and helping people get out. And uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Amen. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right, let me get one more. All right, come on, Isaac Rue. I don't even know if that's your name, but I know that Isaac is your name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Isaac. Um, my fiance, Kitty, and I. So going back about a month, uh, her and I both got COVID uh, early April. And uh, we both got it right about the same time. And it was rough. Um, like, we were both sick. 
we were getting on each other's nerves, and then I decided I needed to go to urgent care because my temperature was spiking up and down. We get down to the hospital, and they plug all the machines in me and everything. They're like, oh, you're having a heart attack. And I'm like, what? So <laughs> turns out, well, they give me the emergency room, and they're like, sorry, the machinery was faulty. You really didn't have a heart attack. So that was that. And I got to ride in an ambulance and everything. But meanwhile, my girlfriend's freaking out because she's like, oh, my God, he's having a heart attack. You know, she's calling my dad. She's calling one of my relatives going, he's having a heart attack. We're going to go to the ER, you know. Turns out it was all faulty machinery, but... Um, it was a pretty hard story, but we, we got out of the, the COVID. We didn't get into any, you know, breathing issues as far as, like, you know, ventilators or anything like that. But it was more mental for both her and I. Um, but by the grace of God, you know, we, we got through it. Uh, we both got in our word. You know, we were going to church, you know, regularly just seeking his word and his faith. And he brought us out of it. And mm-hmm. so today, you know, we're much better. So I think Amen. just... God's grace just got us through it. So. Amen. Amen. Woo! All right, y'all. You ready to sit down, Riker? If not, but you can keep running. I'm not worried. I'm using both mics at once. It's funny. I didn't even need that. <laughs> it's all good. Go ahead. It's all good, Ryan. All right, next slide. First of all, as we look at when we testify, the truth is, is this is a a place that we all get to be. I'm going to move my table out the way because I'm not using it today. I love that the song promises on here because the truth is is that when we look at every single one of those testimonies, it's a promise that God is going to be faithful to us, that he's going to be good to us, that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to restore us in times of sickness. I was like, I, I, I pointed to somebody random over here. Maybe that's prophetic to you. But, like, the truth is, is that at the end of the day, that, there's, that he will be here to help us, to give us purpose, to give us place. As we surrender to him, as we, we step onto the rock of transformation, that it will actually place us into a place that restores us. But that the vehicle that he does that through is through forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Because the problem that separates us from that is sin, you know? The truth is, is we all have our own desires, right? We all have this place that kind of acts us a fool, and we end up going back towards something that actually goes against even the goals that we have. We see in Romans 7, it it talks about that. It has a very good verse that says, why do I do the things I don't want to do? I'm not going to say the tongue twister version of that, but you know, it's like, that's pretty much what it says. And... In, in that, we find that even we will go against the very things we want, but God's promise says that he'll continue to bring us what we need. Amen? All right. Next slide. See, the truth is, is we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it says we are only fooling ourselves, not living in the truth, if we claim we have not sinned. We're calling God a liar. And showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I'm starting this off with a bang, right? And reality is, when we're talking about forgiveness, grace, and mercy, we're really talking about, I need Jesus. How many people in here need Jesus? I need him today. I need him yesterday. And I'm going to be crying out to him tomorrow. And in this, it starts with a place where we recognize that our God is faithful and full of promises but that it comes from the place where we need him. And as soon as we forget that we need him, we think we're perfect, we we fool ourselves, and we forget our first love. We're forgetting the place that he dwells in our hearts and pours out a gift that we never chose. Amen? Next slide. So sin and forgiveness... Is it's like that in 1 John 1, 9, it says, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So in that place, we see that ultimately, in this world, do you always get forgiven when you apologize? 
If you take a weaker position and go, you know, I might made a mistake, does that open us up sometimes to get in the lashing? The beautiful part is, is that even as I said, this impossible place, is, is that God, who is perfect, no matter what, he continues to pour out. And he, he, no matter what, will continue to be in a place that pours out love, that pours out this place instead of abusing us and breaking us and tearing us up or bringing just justice. His heart is to pour out forgiveness. And so as he pours out forgiveness, it's a place that has a purpose. It has a place. And if he really is an intentional God, if he's really a loving God, like as we said, loved past limits, intentionally intimate, then that means that it goes past a place of just what we have been dealt with in this world. So far, this series, as we've talked about what we believe, has nothing to do with what you do. I want to say that again. This series has nothing to do with what you do. That's this first couple of sermons. And the reason why is because we have a God who has an intention, who has a heart, who has a place for us that is contrary to this world. And this world is very harsh, but our God is very good. And he, go ahead and go to the next slide for me. He, he has given us a gift, and that gift is forgiveness. That gift is grace. It, it, it's, not, it's not something you earn. It's not something that you do. See, in Ephesians 1, 7 through 8, it says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. He has showered it on you. He's poured it out on you. It's a gift that he gave for us to be impacted, for us to, to receive. It's not something for us to earn. Go to the next slide real quick. See, because his heart, the spirit of the sovereign Lord, is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released. And prisoners will be freed. All you guys know that this is a really big verse to me. Like, actually, this chapter is really big to me. His heart is revealed that even what he wants to pour out is forgiveness to heal us. He, it, 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 that forgiveness withholds what we do deserve in this place. It ends up having a place that it, it actually takes away and releases the ability to judge. It says, I forgive, so I will withhold my justice on you. But then, in that, that heals us and allows us to be restored in relationship and allows our hearts to be bound up and restored, even our beliefs and our ability to be touched. There's a place where us as captives have the ability to receive something we never asked for, we never deserved, we never actually even knew we wanted. And just like Nehemiah's people and the heart that he was born with, a people had lost a hope for what was available to them. And in that same place, God's heart for the captives, for the things that have been done against us, the world we don't know that is out there, is actually to give us something we never knew that we wanted to give us something that we never even would ask for, something we could never deserve, which is grace. But then us as prisoners, I don't know about you guys, but there's places where I've acted a fool. I told you in the beginning of the sermon, this sermon's about how I need Jesus. And so in the same place is God gives mercy as well. And that mercy is to say, you know, I see where you're going to be that son who just might need a little check-in today. You know what I mean? And that mercy pours out to actually give freedom to have a new life, to have a new way. It's a blessing. Go to the next slide for me. 
See, now we're going to get to the real good stuff, right? I mean, I would have my laptop, but the charger doesn't work. So in some ways, I'm kind of, you know, we're going all up off the brain. And uh, the truth is, is that when we look at grace versus mercy, it's interchanged in English, but it's nowhere the same. If we were to look at a story where I I was going to break down the whole entire meaning of it, especially its origins in English and blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, is that I don't think it's really that important today, obviously. So let's just talk about a story, and it'll show the big difference. Let's say a robber broke into your house. He stole all your money from your safe, all your, all your valuables. You come in. He gets caught, right? Mercy would be to say, I'm not going to charge him when we find out that the man's kids are starving, that his family, he lost his job, and that, like, ultimately he's hopeless. You know what I mean? And the man tried to commit suicide the other day. Grace would actually be that you would then go take him out of jail, give him money, and make sure that he's okay and that he has an opportunity for a new job that he has the clothes and the food for his kids. There's an outstanding outpouring of will that happens with grace. It's about the will of the giver, not about the, the qualification of the earner. So what I'm saying to you is, just to even make it really simple, is whoever's giving grace, it's about them, it's not about you. So when God pours out grace, it's about how great he is, and how good he is, and what he actually has to provide, not about what we deserve. When we talk about mercy, it's like what you do deserve, but I'm withholding it. And in that place, it's like withholding the punishment. Go to the next slide. I know I'm zooming through some of this, but forgiveness, grace, mercy, a gift of salvation. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. The gift of salvation is a place that is given to us, not by our works, not by our placement, but in an impossible world where forgiveness is a fantasy. How many of us have always heard forgive and forget, right? How many of us have really experienced that from another human? In that place, we have all ended up in a place that really in our brain we go, yeah, this person's going to really hold it against me forever. And we think that judgment in this place is coming. But within the place that God sees us, that he's purchased for us, that he's paying for us. It's really a forgiveness that he pours out to impact us, to heal us, to bring us into what his ultimate will is, which is to be with us, to save us. And it comes back to a place where we have to to turn to him, to be dependent on him, to release kind of this place of what we're doing so that we can transform. Even like Mr. Ryan's like little testimony is the reality is, he recognized he was acting a fool. And he's looking for something that can actually help the people now that it was that he was helped from. And he's still going through. The beautiful part is, is that like he recognizes what he was doing was wrong. And the cool part is, is God is a rescuer. God doesn't say you have to get yourself up and be perfect. But what he says is I actually already see you as who I created you to be because I've already paid for it. I paid with my own blood. I paid with my own life. And in that, it's, it's according to Christ Jesus, and who's in eternity for goodness, who's already got the good credit. You, you got bad credit. You got the 436. You know what I mean? It's, it's bad. <laughs> Jesus is the great co-signer. <laughs> He's a good 820. You know? <laughs> and the truth is, is that when he signs on, no matter what, you're getting brought in because he pays an ultimate price 
and pays for the backup. He's going to set you up into this relationship for the ability. And ultimately, this forgiveness, this grace and mercy is not just words. It's not just fantasy. It's something that we actually get to experience. As we look around in this room, this is a testimony of miracles around us because each of the stories around you have many stories of forgiveness, grace, and mercy. The truth is, is once again, because there's parts where it feels impossible, that we, we, we really look at this as a fantasy sometimes, not as dreams of me fully believing in all of its aptitude. What ends up happening is we hide where we've been forgiven, where grace has been poured out and mercy pours out. And the reason why is because we're afraid that people will judge us the way that we judge ourselves. But what if this gift of salvation and this testimony of it being out front is the very thing that actually helps the people around you believe that that God is real and that he could really do that? Where it could raise up the dreams of a God who really does that, of a God who does forgive, a God who does make able of a God who is here to be fulfilling of his promises. That even though it might seem superfluous, even though it might seem silly, it might seem, you know, just like, just like it's there to show how weak you are, what if that actually is a place that show his glory, show how good he is? And that ultimately that gift that is saving you is also a testimony of how he is saving Go to the next slide. See, the truth is, is that his grace won't be in vain. His heart that pours out to save won't be in vain. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, But by the way, grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me did not pr- prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. I want you to hear this place where can you guys will yourself into a better relationship with God? No. Can you will yourself into more salvation? Can you will yourself into forgiveness, grace, or mercy? No, but can it, can it sure inspire you to do better? The truth is, is each of you are here not by your, like, you are here in this building because you chose to be. But I'm saying you guys aren't here seeking God just because out of nowhere you're like, this is the greatest decision ever. But the truth is, is that, like, he stirred something in your heart to show you something good. His salvation came, and it was a place that in the middle of the impossible, we want to be impossible stories. That in the middle of your impossibility, not just what's impossible in this world, but what's impossible to you, he showed that those limits don't exist. And he intentionally worked. And as he intentionally worked, there's places that you didn't ask for things. You didn't want things. You didn't know to dream for things. And he brought you into experiences, and those experiences expanded your view of this world expanded your possibility of relationship with him, expanded what you, des- you think you deserve. And those little bits of your story actually made something possible that you never dreamed was going to be able to happen. We're all looking for purpose and placement and reason why we're here. That is the call of everybody's heart to say, what can I do, right? But the beautiful part of what God's heart is, is you can do is be with me. And he gives what's able to do that through forgiveness and grace. And it actually pours into something that cries out to labor as we allow it to define us. Go to the next slide. But how do I get from a place where this grace is just something that's happened to me to somebody who's crying to walk out what it is? Because a lot of times when we talk about grace and mercy, it's a fluffy conversation, right? It's like, it's this place where it ends up feeling great, which this message hasn't particularly had a lot of. 
And what's funny about it is, is it's beautiful because God is so good that he just doesn't leave us to just our own chances. He gives us something good, and then he gives us truth to go along with it. He gives us something good, and then he directs us in our way. He gives us something good, and he illuminates the pathway so we don't end up tripping and falling again. But none of us like to hear we're wrong or the truth. But what's beautiful is that God's grace and mercy with truth and love transforms us into the image of God. It says that what causes us to to repent? The goodness of God. But wait a second. Repenting is turning from your ways. So how would you turn from your ways if you don't All you got was good stuff. Well, it's because good stuff reveals where you are acting a fool. It's like, in reality, it's it's just as it is a place that says, I forgive you, I release you of this. It also says, I know for myself, it says you don't got to keep acting this way. You're not held to be by this boundary anymore. Even as a captive, you are no longer held by the chains that your parents put on you. You're no longer held by the, the, the beliefs of what's going to hold you down. You're no longer held to this place of what you've been, the dreams of what you, you didn't have. But I'm giving you the freedom to actually experience me and the dreams that you do have. But in that same place, you know, you know that you deserve what you get too. There's some things that you have acted a fool. You're in that place because you've been making those decisions and there's even more decisions you made up in the darkness that nobody even knows about. That if that happened and it came out, there would be some judgment. But where God is like, I'm actually releasing that. I'm letting it go so that you ultimately have the freedom to walk with me without thinking you're fake. Without thinking that you have to prove yourself. Without thinking that you have to earn a place with me because I've already paid the price. But it takes us also hearing that we got to let go with the things that we're, we're doing. It also is saying you got to let go of those chains. You got to let go of the, that old life. You got to let go of this place. Forgiveness is forgiveness. You know what I mean? It pays the price, it covers it up. But if you don't let go of it, you're still holding on to the thing and you're experiencing the judgment still because you're still holding on. Grace is giving you something that you don't deserve. But if we don't learn how to receive it and actually step into the things we're receiving and quit doing the the things that we we just can hold on to, we're still in that same place. Go ahead, next slide. Can everybody turn to Ephesians 2, 1 through 10? Who's got their good reading on today? Who can read good? Check, check. Who wants to read up on? Anybody want to read? All right, come on. So this is uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. Hold on, I got the amplified version. This is going to take about 10 minutes. Yeah, just do the NLT. NLT. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in his mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. 
for he raised us from the dead, along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Hallelujah. So what I, I try to do with this sermon is structured in the same way that we see that verse structured. Go to the next slide. When we say that we believe in forgiveness, grace, and mercy, first we're recognizing that we're not dealing with a human. We're dealing with a loving God who loves past what I understand, loves past what I can get. We're also dealing with an intentionally intimate God, which is, you remember the first two, DNA, right? But then that this God has a plan, and that plan ultimately is outside of just what I'm capable of. So because of some of my decisions that, like, I've made that have made me separate and dependent on other things than God, he pours out forgiveness to heal this relationship. He pours out a place where he is restoring restoring even the ability to unify with him. That he is binding up the wounds of our heart so that we can end up with him. That ultimately that he blesses with grace. That he's blessing us with things we never asked for. I don't know how many of you guys outright asked for God to just shake up your life. But the truth is, is when we sign on, that's what God does. You know what I mean? We like a lot of the things that end up getting us mixed up. But when we look even at this verse, he blesses us while we're even obscured in our vision. When our limits are this big, he starts talking about something that's so much larger. And that in that, as he blesses us with something that he, he knows that we never deserved, he also withholds something that we do deserve. And that is how we step into a relationship with him. But in that relationship with these three experiences, it actually restores what we were created to be. It restores what we were always meant to to have. It restores a place that you are no longer disqualified, defiled, diminished, defeated. You know, it's like all of a sudden you're pre-approved. And we're brought into a place that we can start stepping into things that we didn't know were actually for us. We talk about a lot of big ideas But when we look at number seven, we're free to be who God's created us to be, which is with him. We're being with God, for God. As he forgives us, it allows us to be that. The truth is, is that we talk all these ideas of how to serve him and how to do these things. But how are you even being with God? How are you even in your intimate time? How many of us are just on our face? How many of us are in our word? How many of us really feel that guilt released off? How many of us are still holding on to 10 years ago? How many of us are holding on to five years ago? How many of us are last night? How many of us are burdened down and unable to step into the future, tomorrow's relationship, because of a something that happened in the past. The truth is, is all of us have to release things to step forward into the impossibility of the future. 
step into the relationship and the kind of place to relate to God in the ways that he wants. To make the things that God wants us to be to him, with him, and for him in, it means that we have to let go of the limits of yesterday so that we can actually step into the reality of tomorrow. And for all of you, I don't care what you're in. I don't care where you're at. I know that we got addicts in the room. We have places where we have emotional things going on in the room, people who feel alone, moms, dads, friends, people who haven't had those same struggles in their life, people who think that they haven't sinned, people who think they haven't sinned for a long time. My hope is for today that we all could unite together to be a testimony of how we all need Jesus and that the world we want to make for tomorrow is a kingdom where everybody is brought in because they need Jesus, not because of how perfect they are. Will you guys join me in prayer? Lord, it's funny when I feel like a sermon's gone in a jumble, but, you know, spin cycle happens, Lord, and I just pray that you would continue to pour out and touch people, Lord, that you are faithful, you are the God of promises, that you are the God who, who releases judgment, who releases fear, who releases, who releases us from our chains, Lord. That we have had years and places of experience that says that people will judge us, people will be against us, Lord, but you are not. And if you're not, who can be against us? Lord, that you will bring us into transformation, that you will bring us into an experience of you, that ultimately there is nothing that can withhold us from your love. There is nothing that can separate us from you, Lord. And Lord, I just pray right now that as all the people in this room, that you will show exactly how much we need you and that we would be free to say that. Free that I need you, God. That I can come to you and receive what I need. That I can come to you and be okay that I'm not perfect, that I can't get to what I need without you, that in fact, if I don't come to you, I'm going to be missing out, that your altar is actually a place of reception, that your place is a freedom, that it's a place to release my yoke. Lord, I pray that we all could come to your altar to lay our yokes down. Help us forgive ourselves. Help us forgive others. And most of all, help us to receive your forgiveness. Teach us about grace. And most of all, Lord, let us be transformed by your mercy. I pray that in your name.